views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, July 23rd, 2021. Today's episode, you'll hear about a new test which improves disease diagnosis and helps guide treatment decisions for lupus. Also, you'll hear about same hospitals, same surgeries, but worse outcomes for black patients than white ones. Also, I'm going to tell you about my new adventures with gastroparesis. That's right, and I'll have much more for you regarding biomarker studies uh, regarding lupus. So, you know what I want you to do? All the way from the United States to Mombasa, Garson, Blood War, Nairobi, Kenya. That's right. Get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea. And to my listeners, late at night when you can't sleep and have nothing else to do, you know I appreciate you. Get ready to grab your favorite glass of wine and come on and join the conversation right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. All right, we're back. And I'm asking you to please be patient with me during this time because I am nauseated. I um, have a temp, the antibiotics. I was on for the blood, blood infection. Didn't do anything. And my temp was this morning 100. And I'm having chills. And um Today, I look like I'm five months pregnant. My abdomen feels so tight. I don't know if I'm, um, I know I'm not retaining fluid. It can't be that. And um, all I can hold down on my stomach is... um, applesauce, a little cup of Mott's applesauce, and to control the nausea is crackers. Um, the Zofran, it works sometimes, but this is um, really something else to deal with. Um, I went to the doctor yesterday with my sister because um, she had been experiencing nosebleeds. And no, I didn't knock her in her nose, in case you're wondering. Um, 
and I went to put on a t-shirt and I said okay and so I grabbed one of my t-shirts off the hanger and put it on I said oh no I said "Uh uh-uh it was so tight it was so tight on me and I said that I was going to take a picture of this and post it on my Facebook page so that anybody else that is going through gastroparesis, this is what I'm going through, so don't feel bad. So I posted it, and my other sister Wanda called me, and the first thing that came out of her mouth was, you look like you're pregnant. I said, well, if I'm pregnant, um, it was the holy conception. I said, no, that's my stomach. She said, you that big? I said, yep, my stomach is that big. And um, it's just, it's just tight. It feels, it feels like I'm pregnant. No joke. It feels like. Um, when I was pregnant and, um, you know, if it's not one thing or another dealing with this illness, but I just want somebody to know the symptoms, um, of gastroparesis. There is nausea, vomiting, especially vomiting, undigested food a few hours after eating. Now, I haven't vomited, but I felt like um, I had to, and I had to run in the bathroom one day because I thought I was just going to just hurl all over the bedroom floor. The feeling of fullness even after eating very little and I feel full before eating the applesauce. The acid reflux or heartburn, I had that before I was diagnosed. The abdominal pain, let me tell you about the pain. Oh my God. And it's not meant to scare anybody, but oh my God, the pain. And usually I can take pain really well, but mine would come right before I would lay down and I would just be moaning in the fetal position that my stomach was hurting so bad. There is changes in the blood sugar levels. There is a lack of appetite and malnutrition. Lack of appetite, I have. Um... And weight loss. I don't know if I've lost any weight or not because I feel so full and so bloated. Um, I tell you, the bloating is, is, I can deal with everything else but the bloating where you, I can't fit into... Um, my tops, you know, that's the part that's getting to me. Um, Yesterday, I told uh, my sister, I said, I look like I'm, I'm about six or seven months pregnant or that I drink a lot of alcohol. Now, women have a tendency when they consume liquor, they get a gut. 
and um, that's that's what I'm go- oh, excuse me that's what I'm going through right now no I'm not drunk because I hiccup but my um, abdomen is so bloated extended and full I don't know if if it's liquid you know fluid in my stomach or abdomen I just don't know I really don't but it it is a trip along with the nausea I thought you know having lupus and being sick um, feeling like you have the flu all the time with something else to deal with. But this is um, really a trip to deal with. You know, I have a doctor's appointment coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, I'm quite sure... I'll be placed on a different type of antibiotic. I'm quite sure that I will receive, I uh, I think the prescription is called Reglin, um, for the gastroparesis. Um, The constipation is really, and, and maybe that's TMI, too much information, but it, it's... It's really something else. And and right now I find myself sitting with my hand placed on top of my um, stomach like I do when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, But it is no joke. It is no joke at all having this condition. Um, And yes... I'm tired of uh, looking like I'm pregnant, but it's it's a day-to-day journey, and I'm playing the cards that I have been dealt once again, um, dealing with lupus, and that's why I tell you guys on a regular basis, it's more to lupus than that L U. P-U-S, five-letter word. Nobody wants to talk about the other underlying conditions that can occur. And that's what I try to bring to you to tell you everything that I um, am going through dealing with this condition. You know, if it's not the hair loss, it's the aches and pains. If it's not the aches and pains, it's the numerous um, stays in the hospital. It's the numerous visits to the ER. It's the numerous changes in medication. So it's, it's a lot. You try to stay healthy, but it's hard when your body is constantly doing something opposite to what you want it to do. So it's always readjusting to your body and to the lupus. So this may be a um, a short um, podcast today because like I said I'm really not feeling that well but I wanted to bring you something so when I return we will be discussing test improves disease diagnosis and helps guide treatment decisions with lupus so Stick with me. If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us 
on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. Newly published research further demonstrates the effectiveness of the lupus diagnostic test known as AVIS, lupus test. Physicians' confidence in diagnosing lupus increased with increasing AVIS test scores, and physicians felt more confident ruling in the possibility of lupus based on positive advised test results compared to the com- commonly used anti-DSDNA lab tests. Additionally, the advised tests also helped increase physicians' confidence in ruling out lupus compared to the anti-DSDNA test and help guide their treatment decisions. With increasing advised scores, physicians were more likely to begin treating patients such as with hydroxychloroquine, better known as Plaquenil, an important and commonly prescribed medication in the treatment of lupus. We all know that lupus is a difficult disease to identify. And because of this, it often takes many years before people with lupus receive a diagnosis to help improve diagnostic lab tests for lupus. The Lupus Foundation of America partnered with the Life Science Company to support early research on the development of advised tests. To date, multiple studies have shown that this advanced test can help reduce time to early and accurate lupus diagnosis, allowing people to get the treatment they need as soon as possible. Now, we all feel that it should not take months or years to receive a diagnosis for um, any illness. But in the case of lupus, since it mimics so many other illnesses, um, it would be great if this um, test could improve diagnosing the disease in a much um, quicker time. That would not only take the guesswork out of physicians, but it would alleviate a lot of stress from those of us who have gone through um, months, and in my case, years, of being diagnosed with this illness. So what are your thoughts? Are you excited about this new diagnostic test that helps not only um, improves the disease diagnosis, but helps guide the treatment decision? So Chime in and tell me your thoughts. Stick with me. Now you're going to hear about same hospitals, same surgeries, but worse outcomes for black patients um, rather than white ones. We know that people of color Um, get a bad break, I want to say all around in the medical field, but 
I'm not going to say that because you have some facilities and some doctors who don't look at the color of a patient, but they look at the illness and your signs and symptoms and try to try to help you. But when it comes to same hospitals, same surgeries, but worse outcomes for black patients than white ones, a new report found that black patients are more likely to suffer illnesses or injuries tied to surgical procedures than white patients, even when they go to the same hospital. Black patients are significantly more likely to suffer dangerous bleeding, infections, and other serious problems related to surgical procedures than our white patients treated at the same hospital, according to a new analysis from the nonprofit Urban Institute. The analysis funded by the Robert J. I'm sorry, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation builds on earlier research showing that black patients are more likely than white wants to endure injuries and inquire illnesses in the hospital. A previous analysis from the Urban Institute found that part of the reason for that gap is that Black patients are less likely to be admitted to high-quality hospitals than white patients based on key measures meant to gauge patients' care. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) But the new report found that even when they are going to the same hospitals, Black patients are more likely to suffer illnesses or injuries tied to surgical procedures, including hemorrhages during the surgical process and sepsis following an operation than white patients of the same gender and age group even when admitted to the same hospital black patients experience higher rates of hospital acquired injuries or illnesses (coughs) according or shortly after surgical procedures relative to white patients the analysis concluded That troubling pattern persisted even when researchers compared black and white patients with similar kinds of insurance coverage. When they focused specifically on patients covered by Medicare and when they limited their analysis to Hospitals with a higher percentage of black patients, which could theoretically be more adept at rooting out racial bias. And the analysis found that it shouldn't make much difference whether the hospital had more or less resources as gauged by their share of patients with private insurances. Now, and I'm going to say this, I have found 
um, when I was doing my um, externship, I have found that the hospitals that um, cared for those who were of color that were in the inner city had less resources than other hospitals, which would um, take on the Blue Crosses, um, the MetLife, and um, the private insurers. And that is a bias, in my opinion. It should not depend on what type of insurance you have. It should depend on the care of that patient. All jokes, all um, putting everything aside, let me say. It's all about the care of the patient. Now, one of the researchers in this study said it was disheartening. Um, and they were in the Health Policy Center at the Urban Institute who authored the report. And they further stated that there are clearly some effects of structural racism that are not isolated in healthcare, but they're clearly prevalent and persistent across all kinds of comparisons. Closing racial gaps in patient care will require changing the way that healthcare is provided within each hospital, not just changing who goes to which hospital, the report concluded, you're going to have to do some work within institutions, the researcher stated. The Urban Institute analysis examining hospital discharge records from roughly half of the states across the country, not including California, as of four years ago, the information drawn from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Databases included complete records for discharges from more than 2,300 hospitals, according to the report. The analysis looked at nearly a dozen measures of patient safety, including general patient safety indicators tied to a broad range of hospital discharges, such as how frequently patients got infections related to catheters or pressure ulcers from remaining in one position too long as well as injuries and illnesses specifically related to surgical procedures. Now, such measures are used by healthcare researchers as a way to zero in on problems associated with Now, I don't know what happened, but the weather here is storming here, and my um, something went wrong with the system, and it stopped. But to repeat it again, such measures are used by healthcare researchers as a way to zero in on problems associated with faulty care in hospitals rather than the ailments that patients have when they walk in the door. If you get a sepsis infection 
from an operation or a catheter infection, these are things that shouldn't have happened to you. Um, researchers further stated that many hospitals have protocols to virtually eliminate these kinds of things from occurring. And they are seen as pretty objective quality of care measures. The report found that the evidence was mixed on whether Black patients had worse results for the general patient safety indicators than white patients in the same hospital. For instance, the analysis found that Black patients were more likely to get catheter-related infections than white patients. But white patients were more likely to have falls in the hospital that cause hip fractures when comparing patients of the same gender and age group in the same hospital. But the results were clearly worse for Black patients when it came to ailments related to operations. The analysis found Black patients had worse rates for all seven of the safety indicators related to surgery and the rates were clinically large and statistically significant for four of those measures, hemorrhages and serious bruising due to blood vessel damage, respiratory failure after an operation, blood clot related problems such as pulmonary embolism or DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and sepsis after surgery. Black patients had a 27% higher rate than white patients of the same gender and age group at the same hospital of having sepsis after an operation. The analysis found they also had a 30% higher rate of pulmonary embolism or deep vein, vein thrombosis during the surgical process, according to the report. Researchers went on to say, it's hard to think about where to start in addressing the issue. The report offered up several ideas, including penalties in Medicare reimbursements for hospitals that have such racial gaps, trying some federal funding for state Medicaid programs to measure um, of patients' um, racial disparities and safety and periodic auditing of whether care is standardized across patients' group within hospitals. Let's be for real, people. It also boils down to you have some staff that is overworked, such as I'm talking about the nurses. And you also have some people who go in it in this field of healthcare because it's good money. And it's nothing wrong with that, but it you have to have a particular 
how do I want to say it? I'm going to say it. You have to have a heart to do it. You have to care about people to be in the healthcare field, not because, oh, I can make this and this and this and that. And once you get into it, you think it's a glorified job, but you have nurses who are overworked. So come on. Um, And you have some hospital aides who are just there for a paycheck. And I'm not joking. They are just there to get a paycheck and go home and think they could treat patients any type of way. And it is totally wrong. So yes, there are differences in what they consider um, hospitals in the inner city than hospitals in the suburbs. There is a difference of how you are treated um, when you have state insurance versus Medicare, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or a commercial insurance. It is a difference in treatment. Come on. We know that with state insurance, you'll get the least done for you. And they'll give you some Tylenols and tell you to go home and then you're right back in that ER or that doctor's office. And when you're dealing with these insurance, the HMOs, where you have to go to a particular doctor or a particular hospital to receive a service, how do you think your care is going to be? And to be realistic, most patients of color would like to have a doctor of color. And a better way of putting this is that most black patients want a black doctor who could understand what they're going through versus um, a white doctor. It's bad to say, but that's how it is. And I'm not saying that it exists for all black patients, but when it comes to the older um, patient base, they want a black doctor that understands what they are going through that they could speak more comfortably with about what they're going through. So, same hospitals, same surgeries, but worse outcomes for black patients than white ones. What are your thoughts? Think about it and let me know. Stick with me. I'll be back. Well, guys, I'm going to have to cut it early. Um. I'm not feeling well, to be honest with you. And um, my lymph nodes are beginning to hurt right now. Um, As I said when I first started this podcast, I think it's been a year ago, I had my submandibular gland removed, and now I'm having pain um, from the lymph nodes that um, exist in that same area. They took some lymph nodes along with that gland, but um, the lymph nodes are infected along with my bloodstream being infected and the gastroparesis and the lupus and the nausea and everything. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. And um, while I'm sitting here doing this podcast I have the um, fan on and I think 
to me it's hot and then I had to go get um my robe and put it on because I'm cold so my thermostat is all messed up but I I did not want to miss an episode for you guys but I hope you enjoyed it and also um know that I have two very interesting guests lined up in August for you to hear. One has APS and lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome and lupus, and another had to learn how to do things all over again from having a stroke and being in an accident. So Look for that in August. And also, um, the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendricks Foundation is still in need of undergarments for those living on the street. Once again, I will be feeding those living on the street in September, knock on wood, if the Lord is willing and I'm not in the hospital. So you can go on over to https colon forward slash forward slash C E M P H foundation dot com. Um If you would like to make a monetary donation, if you would like to send a pack of men's underwear and t-shirts, you can send it to CEMPH Foundation, P.O. Box 20954, Ferndale, Michigan, 48. Two two zero. Um, before I go, I think that's it. I want to leave you with this: be your own advocate. Watch what if you see it after a parent or a loved one who is suffering from an illness, and they have to go in and out of the hospital or. Um, in a nursing home, make sure you visit the hospital or the nursing home on a regular basis and catch them off guard. Never let them know uh, that you're coming and just pop up one day unexpected. Let me leave you with this. Be yourself no matter what. Some will adore you And some will hate everything about you. But who cares? It's your life. Make the most out of it. Go on and live your life. I'm Susan Hendricks, your host for My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I want you to also go over to My Story, Living with Lupus lupus.com and go on over there and shop because 100% of the proceeds goes to the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendrix Foundation to help those who have chronic illness purchase medication, food, and so on and also help those that are living on the street i'll see you next week for another episode have a safe peaceful and oh so blessed weekend